Thanks so much for coming, Seth. So thanks so much uh, for being here so early. I'm going to try to be coherent. If I start to get incoherent, then Ali is sitting here on the side and he's going to ask me a question. But um, I have a kind of moment of clarity, so I'm going to take advantage of it because there are a few points that I would like to make regarding this project because it's kind of a culmination of nearly seven months of work. This was really not supposed to be this long of a project, but it sort of opened up into so many different trajectories that it, it just warranted this kind of work, and it, the work is probably going to continue even after this. So what you see at what you're going to experience, hopefully, at Australia Haven is uh, the first full-scale version of this. Uh, there was one other prototype uh, version uh, up in Norway, in Kilkenes, as part of the Dark Ecology Project um, that wasn't yet the phased array. I think the thing that I was thinking of in the beginning was this notion of transmitting sound. If you transmit sound, it just has to do with loudness. But I didn't realize that the tones I was going to be dealing with really go down that low. And I'll, I'll try to open up a little bit of that aspect. Luckily, we have um, John to talk next, who's probably going to get a little bit deeper into details on that. A small footnote, there is a talk that was given up at Kilkenes that has been published in uh, the Geologic Imagination book that gives a lot of the details that I'm probably just going to be skimming over because I'm just going to be giving a short uh, kind of intro. So first of all, I would really like to thank Sonic Acts uh, and the team for commissioning this work because works like this cannot be realized without these kind of collaborations. I, as an individual artist, could never manage to do something like this. And it's not only uh, um, in terms of the commission and the funding bodies that, of course, we're all grateful for. It's a huge logistical operation. Uh, it involves, uh, just in terms of the technique that's gotten involved, it's, uh, it, we're in dialogue with scientists, engineers, um, uh, people from the Royal Institute of uh, Weather here, the KNMI, um, as well as dialogue with the port, which is one of the, uh, all the rumors, by the way, that you've heard about this project that have probably been circulating the last few days are true. It's been an absolute logistical nightmare, not because of us. Um, but the site, the main problem was uh, the issue of site, which actually becomes an interesting thing in the end, uh, the question of uh, what is landscapes in, in the Dutch context. Of course, it wasn't a question in Norway. <coughs> I'll backtrack a bit and say where this project started. It started with the proposition of investigating the relationship between hearing, sound, and a question of experiencing landscape. So first of all, peripatetic listening, which is not the listening that we have since the 19th century, the, the, the listening where you're walking around and experiencing sound. We're used to creating containers which in various degrees control the type of reverberation that we have. This is a very specific kind of acoustics here. It has to do with church acoustics and also then is transferred into this kind of uh, rock and roll uh, version that, that um, uh, goes back to, to uh, certain recording practices as well. So there are all of these contexts that all have to do with interior space, but this idea of just walking and listening is something that I think we don't have enough of, and I don't think the soundscape even begins to explore it. Armory Schaefer, that was a small poke at Armory Schaefer there. Um, but uh, what I didn't expect was that uh, this connection of sound and the geographic uh, was going to focus on, on environmental sound. In the beginning, it was, there was the question of actually synthesizing sound. I was interested in pure tones uh, that have a certain frequency scale and relationship. I mean, this slide is going to be up there for a while, so you can, <coughs> you can have a look at that. The audible range, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, is roughly uh, 1.7 centimeters long is the highest tone that we can hear probably when we're born. Uh, I definitely can't hear 1.7 centimeter long waves anymore. Uh, and the lowest tone is around 17 meters. So that's approximately the range of, of frequencies that we're hearing. Now, the, the area that I'm moving into is just below the 20 hertz. But it, apparently it goes much, much further than that. I was talking about uh, down to around 4 hertz, which is perceived mostly as a beat uh, or if you're in an interior space as a pressure wave. So where sound breaks down into actual tactile experience where it's no longer purely a, a cochlear, uh, you know, biological factor, but has more to do with, with this idea of sensing as uh, through touch, as contact, looping a little bit back to what Timothy Morton was talking about as an, an aesthetic of touch. So you have that inherently with these deep bass sounds, and that's one of the things that 
venues like this specifically are able to create is a container for that kind of thing. Well, apparently, this kind of thing is happening all the time outside. Um, when you tune down in tone, it seems like sounds fade out. You need a lot more sound pressure in order to have something audible to the human ear. But in fact, <coughs> what's happening in this range is there's an enormous fade in. The further down you go, the more the environmental sound roars. We apparently occupy a very silent portion of the frequency spectrum, and the rest of it is just constantly roaring. <clears throat> and I'll get a little bit into what uh, that roar is. So um, uh, just also to backtrack a little bit in terms of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about hearing, I'm not only talking about acoustics. Um, this is sort of where I'm at at the moment with, with my work. What we hear, the frequencies towards which we reflexively extend at any given uh, historical moment is indicative of the transformations in the state of human subjectivity. I really think that the notion of self in other words, what, the what in sound, what we think we're hearing, the words we're using of that what, um, are extremely important in terms of how they reflect back on how we understand ourselves to be. So there's something very strange about what, in what particular historical moments, what kinds of sounds are being paid attention to, also reflects a little bit back into these more gradual uh, waves of kind of uh, subjective uh, consciousness transformations that are occurring over time, sound being one of the best um, categories to interrogate this sort of thing. So hearing for me is, is a sight rather than a condition. It's not a biological condition. Yes, it does have biological constraints, but it is a sight. And most of these projects that I've been doing recently are kind of ex excavations or attempts to dive into these sites uh, and explore them a little bit more in depth. So, what is it about infrasound? Infrasound is literally the material that connects the solid earth with the oceans, with weather, with modern industrial practices. And that last bit is the important one. This is also something that I think we didn't realize in the beginning when we, when we started this project was how much uh, this project was going to tie into the overall theme of uh, uh, the geologic imagination. Um, and there's, there's a certain moment where I sort of realized that this is really the bandwidth of the Anthropocene when you start to talk about the human footprint as being on par or changing something on the scale of this Earth magnitude. You have that in these very long extended tones. So what is causing this infrasound? What's, what's doing that? Well, I'll take some of the more exotic uh, uh, examples, exploding meteors. When a meteor reaches into the upper atmosphere, it encounters friction. That's another thing that's switched. For some reason, I was always thinking of air as kind of empty and outer space as being a vacuum. It's now we're completely immersed underwater, this whole territory. Um, water and air are just two different liquids with slightly different weight viscosities, so one separates and falls lower than the other. So imagine a meteor going underwater, it just at some point uh, heats up from the friction and, and uh, disintegrates, which creates a pressure wave, a pressure wave that's usually an N-shaped wave if you're registering it on some sort of um, graph paper. And about three seconds later, you're going to get a U-shaped wave, which is the reflection off of the stratosphere uh, when the first uh, wave from the shock comes back. <coughs> Meteors. Calving Arctic glaciers, so global warming, uh, this acceleration of, of glaciers uh, melting and collapsing is a huge surface of material that falls into water, creates a very long sound wave. Avalanches. Um, volcanoes typically have frequencies between one and five hertz, which is rather high for infrasound. Um, Northern Lights, aurora. Um, this is a disputed category in terms of how exactly uh, the infrasound is being produced, but in any case, there are sounds that are coming uh, with these aurora experiences. One of the most curious categories uh, was uh, termed the voice of the sea. When, when scientists started looking into this bandwidth uh, of infrasound, uh, they discovered that there was a part of the spectrum that was constantly saturated, regardless where, of where the infrasound sensor was placed. And it took a while until they figured out that it was actually uh, called micro um, baromes, 
uh, and it had to do with the fact that the ocean itself in a very severe storm area, the entire surface of the water moves ever so slightly up and ever so slightly down, and that compresses the air with the top of the atmosphere and back down, sending out a wave that travels all the way in between the surface of the earth and the atmosphere. So it, you can be in the middle of the desert and you can hear this song of the sea if you have this kind of transducer. Now, why do they transmit so far? It has to do with the inverse square law. Particles of water and air dampen the higher frequency components. You have different spectral components for different parts of the bandwidths. The further down you go in frequency, the less those particles matter. To the point where you go below 15 hertz, these sound waves just continue to travel. It's also immense amounts of force that are involved in some of these uh, sound actions, to the point where they can travel thousands of kilometers. The second thing that helps these uh, sounds propagate is temperature inversion in our atmosphere. So the further up you go, there, there are moments where the temperature suddenly changes. I'm not gonna go into detail on that, but what it does is in fact it creates a different refractive index that eventually will bend the waves back down. And this is something that the animal kingdom knows uh, inherently or intuitively by making a, a wolf calls, uh, elephant communication sounds that use infrasound for communication and territorialization will um, um, inevitably uh, do these kind of patterns uh, after dark because that's also when the infrasound comes out. So when there's a cooling of the air uh, towards the ground, there's a temperature inversion that occurs that this infrasound actually transfers uh, much better at night. If you look at these recordings off of uh, infrasound sensors during the day, it's just a solid bandwidth like that of noise, and then it grows like that at night and goes back down again in the morning. <clears throat> so uh, this is the point at which I'd like to say that there's the, what are the longest sounds that are involved we're talking about sounds that are around 171 kilometers long. This is usually, uh, uh, when you're talking about sound, something that's not unfamiliar with electromagnetics, with radio communication, but not with acoustic waves. These are just really acoustic uh, waves. And if you can imagine a sound wave that's so long that it takes eight minutes for it to complete one cycle, you say, well, this is not, you know, wh where is the difference between sound and weather? And this is a chart um, that I have from a, a KNMI. Um, sound with frequencies lower than a minimum frequency of audibility is called infrasound. The lower limit of infrasound domain is not strictly defined. Very low frequent events, like meteorological phenomena, are of no interest. Therefore, we adopt a value of 500 seconds as the lower limit of infrasound. So it's a completely arbitrary position at what point infrasound stop and weather begins. So if you can imagine on a, on, a di on a different cognitive, and this is like a jump in, uh, um, it's a lesson to our anthropocentric idea of time that we tend to expand out over the rest of the world. We think that things are much too fast or much too slow. No, it's not. Everything is just gauged in terms of how our perception is working. But if you just look at the sound waves themselves, weather could be just a much slower undulation in, in a larger trajectory of, of patterns that are happening. And in fact, there are these cyclic patterns that have to do also with... Uh, time uh, um, annual conditions. This is the shortest presentation slide-wise I've ever done. I only have four slides in this presentation. And I'm going I'm more than halfway through. Um, this is historically, now this is the one thing that I didn't have time uh, for this uh, the, the, to, to prepare properly, is there the contexts that feed into infrasound are incredibly rich. Uh, this is a, an image from the very first time that um, scientists began to, understand, be, began to understand the fact that infrasound travels such a huge distance. And it had to do with, indeed, a device for weather. So a barogram, uh, which is a barometer, basically, that is measuring the changes in atmospheric pressure, all of a sudden measured a blip. And that blip was measured at locations all across the globe. This is the late 19th century. It was found out that this was indeed the pressure wave from the explosion of Krakatau, the volcano, that continued to travel around the globe for several days, in fact, after it exploded. 
So uh, some of these sounds are so strong that they can circumnavigate the globe. Uh, we've managed to uh, get into that category uh, in the anthropogenic category of sounds. Maybe I'll step back here for a second. Uh, the bandwidths that we contribute uh, to infrasound are mine explosions, so geological kind of excavations. Aircraft sonic booms is one major source. That's another one of these uh, N-wave, U-wave phenomena. Oil refinery gas flares, so gas flares out in the North Sea. Uh, space debris re-entry, the junk that we send out into outer space that eventually comes back into the atmosphere will send ripples as it comes back that will propagate around the globe even though most of the debris will not hit the Earth. It will burn up uh, before it arrives here. Wind turbines and nuclear testing. Nuclear testing is the spike in which uh, we contribute uh, the most to this uh, bandwidth. And it's between 1945 and 1958, more than 250 atomic bomb devices uh, were set off over the globe, um, uh, setting out this nuclear proliferation. And talks in 1958 between Great Britain, the US, and Russia, uh, they came out with an international monitoring system idea. This is 1958 that is still being implemented, in fact, today. So this is not a relic of the Cold War. Uh, there are, at the moment, 50 infrasound stations that are these global network of sensing stations uh, that are picking up sounds and cross-referencing the location, looking out for rogue states that are doing nuclear tests uh, in shallow depths underground. But at the same time, it's also providing immense amount of data uh, which scientists are finding out more about the behavior of the atmosphere. Um, this is the CTBT network, as it's known. If my computer lets me, yes. Ooh, sound can we have? Sorry. Okay. CTBTO Global Alarm System spans the entire globe. Its okay. 337 monitoring facilities are located in 89 countries on Starting all continents. Out. Global alarm system spans the entire BTBTO global alarm system spans the entire globe. Its 337 monitoring facilities are located in 89 countries on all continents and cover all oceans. The system also features an international data center in Vienna and a global satellite communications network for data transmission. When an event occurs, several stations may detect and register the event. Data containing information such as location, time and magnitude of the event are recorded. Data are transmitted via the Global Satellite Communications Network, which is comprised of five satellites positioned around the globe at a height of approximately 36,000 kilometers. The satellites route the data to hubs on the ground. From there, data are transmitted through protected connections to Vienna. So this is this, uh, this, these global array systems, which are, uh, I mean, you can tr trace it back even to World War I with the gun sound ranging, this attempt to localize an explosion based on cross-referencing of different measurement points and calculation of time delays. And this brings back uh, another important contextual aspect um, the, there was a, a paper that was put out in 1986 in Theo Delft um, by Hus Burkhout and Diemer de Vries called Acoustic Holography of, for Sound Control, which was uh, the, the original uh, paper describing the technique of wave field synthesis. Wave field synthesis is a reverse process of phased array. Uh, and in fact, in discussion with Diemer just recently, um, uh, apparently, the uh, knowledge in the Department of Acoustics at Teo Delft before uh, wave field synthesis was invented had to do with uh, knowledge from seismic arrays that was then incorporated into the department and applied in reverse. So even though it's a, it's a concept by Christian Hauchens from the 1600s, um, it only gets fully realized uh, in the 1980s with uh, 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 digital equipment. But uh, what's interesting about this is I'm using a, a group of phased array. These are microphones uh, for uh, infrasound. 
and uh, um, I'm kind of repatriating the technique of phased array and confronting it with its original source, which is the geophysical. So uh, not to take it into the abstraction, but back into this territory of materializing fields. And this is maybe another important point to make. The difference to the test that I was doing up uh, in Norway was that I was in, uh, in dialogue at the time uh, with one of these groups from the CTBT network, and we were using recordings that were done uh, on these infrasound recorders. These uh, devices that I've managed to, to make in the meantime, uh, I'm playing back nearly at the same rate. So it's not a sonification per se. It's not a speeding up where you can suddenly hear the infrasound. It's mostly an amplification. So most of the tones are be just below what you hear. If you go over to the containers, you can feel the, the container itself uh, breathing in a sense. Um, and this maybe is the last part uh, that I want to just make a short comment about, and it has to do with con this contextual explosion that I think um, can happen with, with infrasound. Infrasound has so many of these different uh, arteries that are coming through in so many different directions that uh, at a certain moment, everything becomes part of it. So when you get down into a technical detail, it's not trying to create a technical detail, but it's actually trying to understand how a piece of metal cuts through air, how the shape of a blade is, is making that air move. So there's a certain moment at which sound and weather and the rest of uh, this terrestrial environment uh, completely gets uh, mixed together. Um, I think I will end with that. And... Uh, leave the stage for the rest of the people. So uh, my last comment would just be, uh, instead of coming out with a certain expectation to the site, I would say think of the site more as a site of discharge. If Douglas Kahn was talking about these balls uh, that, that have a charge between them, that when they're close together, there's just electrons that go from one to the other. And when you put them distant enough, there's a spark that goes across. That's how I imagine the site. The site is kind of a spark between uh, the, the people that are perceiving the event and the surrounding. So the surrounding itself is as much or even more a part of the project uh, than, than the sounds per se. So it's not really about the objects that are there or the sounds that you're hearing, but it's really about this kind of resonant trajectory that goes in every which way uh, with these kinds of tones and experiences. Thanks. Thank you.